Okay, good morning everyone. This is Jack Van Horn from the BD2K Training Coordinating Center uh, at the University of California and I'd like to welcome you all to our uh, big it's a knowledge guide to the fundamentals of data science. Uh, today we're going to be hearing from Daniela Witten from the University of Washington in Seattle uh, on the subject of supervised machine learning. Uh, Dr. Witten uh, had earned her bachelor's degree in math and biology uh, with honors and distinction from Stanford University in 2005 and then earned her PhD in statistics from Stanford in 2010. Since 2014, Daniela has been an associate professor in statistics and biostatistics at the University of Washington in Seattle. Her research involves the development of statistical machine learning methods for high dimensional data with applications to genomics and to other fields. She is a recipient, recipient of numerous awards, including an uh, NDSEG Research Fellowship, an NIH uh, Director's Early Independence Award, a Sloan Research Award, and uh, an NSF Career Award. Her work has been featured in the popular media and Forbes Magazine, Elle Magazine, uh, on KUOW Radio, and as a Pop Tech Science Fellow. She is the co-author with uh, Gareth, Gareth James, uh, Trevor Hasty, and Rob uh, Tibshirani Tib of the very popular textbook, uh, Introduction to Statistical Learning. Uh, she was a member of the Institute of Medicine Committee that released uh, the report on the evolution of translational omics. So her talk today will be very appropriate to the subject of big data, uh, computing, um, and statistical learning. Um, once again, I'd like to remind you that if you have any questions for Dr. Witten during her talk, to please uh, submit your questions via the little question submission uh, mechanism here on the right side, usually on the right side of your display, um, and we'll gather all those up and uh, ask them uh, at the end of uh, Dr. Witten's presentation. So without further ado, Dr. Witten, thank you very much for presenting to us today. Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, and so today, uh, as we just heard, I'm going to talk about supervised machine learning. Um, and just to give you an overview, machine learning basically falls into two camps, supervised learning and also unsupervised learning. So the idea behind supervised learning is that we use a data set X to predict or to detect an association with a response Y. Um, so Examples of supervised learning and include regression, where we're trying to predict a quantitative response, classification, where we're trying to predict a categorical response. And you're going to hear a lot about supervised learning today from me. But I do briefly just want to mention that the other big type of machine learning is unsupervised learning. And the idea behind unsupervised learning is that we want to discover the signal in a matrix X and know Y is available. So unsupervised learning is an incredibly important topic, um, and that's actually going to be covered in next week's webinar. And today, instead, I will just be focusing on supervised learning. So there's a couple different flavors of supervised learning, um, and the, maybe the best known flavor is regression. So the idea behind regression is um, that you want to predict a quantitative response such as blood pressure, cholesterol level, tumor size. Um, so the thing that makes regression regression is that um, the response, which I'm going to call Y today, is quantitative. So the other main flavor of supervised learning is classification. And in classification, we are trying to predict a categorical response, such as um, tumor versus normal tissue, heart disease versus no heart disease, um, subtype of disease, and so on. So the only difference between regression and classification is the type of your response Y. If it's a quantitative response, you're in the regression framework. If it's a categorical or a qualitative response, you're in the classification framework. Um, and one thing that I really want to emphasize is that it doesn't matter what type of data matrix X you have. So, so as I'll mention in a couple minutes, the idea is you have a data matrix X, which contains measurements for your variables or your features. You're trying to predict this response Y. Um, so I don't care if your data matrix X is quantitative, if it's categorical, um, it doesn't matter. It's, it's still going to be regression if your response Y is quantitative, and it'll still be classification if your response Y is categorical. 
So regression and classification are the two main flavors of supervised learning. Um, there are also other flavors, like if you have a response that's a survival time, which is possibly censored because um, you know, some people might have died or dropped out of the study and so on, um, then that is a slightly different flavor of supervised learning. But the main ideas that apply to regression also hold for these other flavors of supervised learning. And so today I'm going to just be talking about regression, but again, all of these ideas extend directly to other types of quantitative responses. So I'm going to start off talking about linear models, because linear models give us an incredibly flexible framework for doing regression. Um, and basically, if you're doing supervised machine learning, 90% of what you need fits within the linear model framework. Um, and then at the end of my talk, I'm going to just speak for a few minutes about a really different type of, um, of supervised learning, which is a, a decision tree approach. So to begin, we're in the linear model setting. And the idea is that we have n observations. And for the ith observation, I'm going to call the response y sub i. And I'm going to let xi1 through xip denote the p features for um, that ith observation. So for example, yi might be blood pressure, um, which is a quantitative value. And then xi1 through xip are a bunch of features. Maybe these are biomarkers that we think are predictive of blood pressure. So we want to use these features to predict the response. And in a linear model, we do this um, as follows. We say that yi is just equal to intercept beta naught plus a coefficient beta 1, which gets multiplied by the first feature, xi1, and so on, all the way through to the pth feature, where beta p is multiplied by xip plus a noise term epsilon. So epsilon sub i is a noise term associated with the ith observation. And the idea is that we need to estimate these unknown coefficients, beta naught through beta p. Um, in other words, we have to fit the model. So actually, there's a lot of ways we could fit this model. Um, and I'm going to start by talking about the best known way to fit this model. And then I'll talk about the fact that that best known way isn't necessarily the best approach, um, especially in the context of biomedical big data. But first, let's talk about the simplest way to fit a linear model. and um, if you took dot 101, then you probably saw the least squares approach for fitting a linear model. And the idea behind least squares is that we look for estimates of the coefficients. I'm going to, if you see a little hat on a coefficient, that means it's an estimate. So I'm looking for beta naught hat, beta 1 hat, all the way through to beta p hat, such that the sum of squared errors is as small as possible. So I'm going to sum the quantity yi minus the, the prediction or the fitted value from my model. I get that by plugging in the coefficient estimates. And then I'm going to square that quantity. So this entire term here is called a sum of squared errors. It's also called a residual sum of squares. And when I fit a model using least squares, I'm just looking for these coefficient estimates such that this residual sum of squares is as small as possible. A simpler way to represent this is to say that I'm just looking for coefficient estimates such that the sum of yi minus yi hat squared is as small as possible, where yi hat is the prediction from my model, or rather, or you can also call it the fitted value from the model. So this is a really natural way to, um, to fit a linear model. Um, and it, it works pretty well, especially sort of in the old-fashioned data setting, where you have three or five or eight variables that you've measured and you have a huge number of observations. So this works really well if n is large and p is really small. Um, but as we'll see in a few minutes, um, often in the context of biomedical big data, least squares is not the best way to go. Um, but before I get there, um, here's a picture showing what least squares is actually doing. So here's an example with the response y and two predictors, x1 and x2. So the observations are shown as red circles. And the least squares fit to the data is a plane. Um, it's that green-blue plane that you see in the middle here. And the reason that this is a plane is because we have two features. 
So instead of a least squares line, we have a least squares plane. Um, and these black vertical bars here, they tell us how far yi is from the prediction for yi with our model. So in other words, this, this black vertical bar tells me the distance yi minus yi hat. And so this, this blue least squares plane is actually exactly positioned such that the sum of yi minus yi hat squared is as small as possible. In other words, so that the sum of squared black lines is as small as possible. And you can sort of imagine that if you shifted the plane up or down, or if you wiggled it a little bit, um, now then the sum of squared black lines would actually increase. So, okay, you've probably seen uh, least squares regression before. Um, this is something that comes up like in a classical statistics class. But I want to talk now a little bit about the machine learning perspective on what we're doing. So, in machine learning, when we talk about fitting a model, we say that we're fitting a model on a training set. So the training set refers to the data that you use to actually fit your model. And given that we fit a model on the training set, we can think about the error um, of our model on the training set. Usually we, we think about the, the mean squared error. And you've actually seen this before. This is just 1 over n times that residual sum of squares quantity that we saw a couple slides ago. So remember, the way that we chose the coefficients, beta naught hat, beta 1 hat through beta p hat, was actually just to make this quantity as small as possible. So we basically are guaranteed that the mean squared error is going to be decently small on the training set, because we, we literally chose these coefficient estimates in order to make this mean squared error small. But what I'm trying to emphasize here is that this mean squared error, right now, what I'm showing you is the mean squared error calculated on the training set. And moving forward, I'm going to call this the training error. So this mean squared error, it gives me a representation of how good my model is on the data that I use to fit my model. It does not give me an idea of how good my model would be, hypothetically, on data that I did not use to fit my model. Um, so like if you're familiar with uh, R squared from a linear model, an R squared is just really closely related to the training error. Um, when your R squared is big, your training error is small. There's really actually a one-to-one -one mapping between those two quantities. So it turns out that training error and, and equivalently R squared are not a great way to think about how good your model is. And the reason that they're not good is because they will always improve as we fit a more complex model. So like imagine that first you fit a model with, with three variables and you calculate your, your training error and then you say, hey, actually, maybe I should just add in one more, mo one more variable to my model. Well, your training error is going to go down. It's literally guaranteed to, to, to go down or maybe stay the same as you, increase more, as you increase the number of variables. So training error, we can see right away there's kind of a problem because it's going to look better and better and better as we add more and more variables to our model. And the problem, basically, is that training error quantifies the fit to the training data. So as you fit a more and more complex model to the training data, your model is going to look better and better on the training data. Actually, to the point where if you fit a complex enough model, we can get a perfect fit to the training data with zero error. But the problem here is that what we really care about is the model's performance not on the training data, but rather on a test set. So for me, a model is good not if it accurately describes the training data, but actually if it accurately describes a test set. Because I don't really care about predicting the response on the data that I already collected, because I know the response on the data that I already collected. What I care about is predicting the response on a new observation for which the response is unknown that was not part of my training set. So like if you're um, you know, coming up with some way to predict survival time on the basis of gene expression um, among patients with some disease. Like, I already know the survival time for the patients that I'm using to fit my model. So doing a really great job predicting the survival time for the patients who are in my training set is really not useful. But what I need to do is do a really good job predicting survival time for a new patient who walks into my clinic tomorrow or next week. And that's really the idea behind the fact that the training error is getting at the wrong quantity. Instead, I need to be getting at the model's performance on a test set. 
So just to reiterate, as we fit a more complex model, um, in particular as we increase the number of variables, um, the R squared of our linear model will always increase and the training error will always decrease. Um, so that's, that's just really important to realize because it gives us an idea of the fact that training error and R squared are telling us the wrong thing. So as I mentioned, what we care about is the performance of a model on observations not used to fit the model. And to quantify this a little bit more, what I really care about is the difference between um, the response for a test observation and the prediction for a test observation. Where here, y hat test is the predicted value or the fitted value that I'm going to get if I get a new test observation and I plug the variables for that test observation into the model that I fit on the training set. So the test error is the average of y test minus y hat test squared over a bunch of test observations. And what I really want is a model for which the test error is small. And so we already saw the first two panels of this plot showing that as the complexity of your model increases, the R squared will increase and the training error will decrease. But the really critical thing here is that the test error is not going to continue to decrease as you make your model more and more complex. Actually, the test error is going to bottom out for some certain level of model complexity, which is indicated here using a red arrow. And after it bottoms out, it's going to start increasing. So you can see that in terms of test error, you don't just want to fit an arbitrarily complex model. In order to make the test error small, there's going to be some intermediate level of model complexity. And actually, if you take one thing out of this webinar, it should be this figure. Um, it should be an understanding of the fact that the only thing that matters is test error. Training error is just not relevant. Um, and if you, if you focus on fitting your supervised machine learning models in order to make, your, in order to make the training error small, then you've just totally missed the boat because you'll end up over here with a tiny training error but a really substantial test error. So I just want to try to illustrate the problem with thinking about training error in a, in a small example. So what I'm showing here is just a small, on the left, is just a small simulated data set with a single feature x on the horizontal axis and a single response y on the vertical axis. And the observations are shown in red. And on the left is what you get if you just fit a least squares linear model to the data. So in this example, there's like 20 observations, one feature. I fit a, a linear model to the data and using least squares. And what I can see is that there's clearly like a non-zero training error here um, because the, these red points aren't exactly on the black least squares line. So the training error is non-zero. But this looks like a pretty good model. I can imagine that if I had a, um, a test set, like if I were able to generate more observations, from the same distribution that gave me the red observations, the test error would be like pretty modest. This is a pretty decent fit to the data. But now in contrast, let's look over here on the right. So on the right, it's the exact same setup, but now instead of having two, instead of having 20 observations like we had on the left, we just have two observations on the right. And I'm again just fitting a linear model just with one variable x. But what I see now is that I got a perfect fit to this training data. So my training error on the right is zero. So we look at this picture on the right and we see that I got zero training error, but, but this model on the right, it does not sit well, right? This, is, this model doesn't look good. And if we imagine um, generating more observations from the same distribution, the, this, we'd see this actually is a really bad model. Those additional observations would, would actually be nowhere close to this black line because we overfit the data here. We fit a model that was too complex given the amount of data. With only two observations, you actually can't fit a linear model in a meaningful way. So over here on the right, we got zero training error, but the test error would actually be huge. Um, so this is kind of just an intuitive explanation of the fact that um, training error is not the right thing to be looking at because like on the right here, the training error is zero, but we'd get a really big test error. 
And this is also an example on the right of the fact that even something that seems really simple, like a least squares linear model, can actually be too complex for the data in, in a little example with just two observations. Okay, so one thing that I just keep on referring to offhand is, is this notion of model complexity. Um, model complexity is actually central to absolutely everything in supervised learning. Um, as model complexity increases, training error will decrease. And I've kind of offhand um, been talking about you know, how we can increase the number of variables in our model and then the model will get more complex. But actually, uh, the notion of model complexity is much more general than just the number of variables in the model. And we're actually going to see in a few minutes, um, when we look at ridge regression, an example of a model that might include a lot of variables, but it's not such a complex model. So in other words, if, if it's convenient for you to think about model complexity as like the number of variables in the model, then you should just remember that, that that's one way you can think about model complexity, but it's often not the best way. And, and model complexity actually is, is more general than just the number of variables in your model. Okay, so as model complexity increases, training error will decrease, but the test error might not. Um, I already said this one. Okay, so just to explain in a little more detail what's happening in terms of model complexity, um, there's really two things we need to think about when we think about how good a model is. So the first thing is bias. So the bias of beta hat is the average difference between beta and beta hat if we were to repeat the experiment a huge number of times. So bias is basically telling us how good is our model on average. And as we fit an increasingly complex model, the bias is going to decrease. So this is really good because as it's saying that as we get a more complex model, on average, our model is going to be better and better and better. And that's great because I want a really good model. So that suggests that I should fit a really complex model. But there's a problem, which is that it turns out I don't just care about bias. I also care about something called variance. And the problem is, and the variance of beta hat is the amount by which the beta hats will differ across the experiments. So imagine that I repeated an experiment a huge number of times, and um, I calculated beta hat every time. So the variance of beta hat is just the amount by which these estimates of beta would vary across the experiments. And the problem is that if I fit an increasingly complex model, the variance of beta hat is going to increase. And the test error, which is the thing that I really care about, is actually the square of the bias plus the variance. So the, the thing that happens here is that there's a trade-off between bias and variance. Because as I increase the model complexity, the squared bias is going to decrease, so that's really good. But the variance is going to increase, and that's really bad. And so typically, if your model complexity is really, really, really low, your bias is going to be huge, and your variance is going to be small. But the sum of something huge and the sum of something small is still huge, so that's bad. And you fit, if you fit a super complex model, the bias is going to be really small, but the variance will be huge. And again, the sum of something small plus huge is really huge. Um, and typically, for some intermediate level of model complexity, you can make both of these relatively small simultaneously, and that'll make your test error small, and that's the sweet spot. So what we want is a level of model complexity that makes this sum, and consequently the test error, small. So in other words, we need a model with small bias and also small variance. So you can see this bias-variance trade-off in a picture. Um, model complexity from low to high is on the x-axis. Error is on the y-axis. You can see training error in blue, test error in red. So you can see the training error is monotone decreasing in model complexity, but the test error is not. The smallest test error is happening right here for an intermediate level of model complexity. And this figure also shows you that as you get a more complex model, the bias is decreasing, but the variance is increasing. And for a less complex model, the bias is increasing and the variance is decreasing. OK. So hopefully by now you, you are on the same page as me that test set error is the thing that we care about. Um, 
So if we want to make sure that we're fitting a model with a, a small test set error, then we need a way to estimate the test set error. And basically, there are three ways that we can estimate the test error. And as you'll see, they're actually all pretty similar. So the first one is the validation set approach. And the idea behind the validation set approach is that you have your n observations, you split them into two sets, uh, train your model on one set, and then calculate the test error on the other set. So the validation set approach is great. Um, it, it's very easy to implement. The only problem is that you arbitrarily are splitting your data into two sets. Um, and if you had done a different split of the data, you might get a slightly different estimate of test error. Um, people don't really like that. So to overcome that problem, we can do an approach called leave one out cross-validation. And the idea behind leave one out cross-validation is that we have our n observations. Um, we fit a model using all but the first observation. So you can see we're leaving out the first observation in this top row here, fitting a model on the remaining observations, and then calculate the test error on the first observation. Next, we fit a model on all but the second observation and evaluate the test error on the second observation, and so on. We do this n times. Each time we fit the model on all but one of the observations, and we test on the remaining observation. Then we average the error rates that we get, and that gives us a really good estimate of the test error. So leave one out cross-validation is really nice. It's very systematic. It feels thorough because we leave out every observation one at a time. Um, but the problem is that often it's computationally um, undesirable because we have to fit n models in order to get an estimate of our model complexity. And if, if n is a really big number, like we have a really big sample size in our study, then this isn't going to fly. So typically the preferred approach is something called k-fold cross-validation. And here I'm showing you an example of k-fold cross-validation with k equals 5. And the idea is that we split the observations into five sets. And we're repeatedly going to train the model on four sets and evaluate its performance on the fifth. So for example, right here, the, in blue, um, you can see my training set. I'm going to fit the model on the training set, evaluate the test error on this test set in orange. And then I'm going to repeat, but I'm going to be changing each time which set of observations I'm considering to be the test set average those five error rates, and that gives us an estimate of our test error. So it's really up to you how you want to estimate test error. Um, leave one out cross-validation, the validation set approach, and k-fold cross-validation are all perfectly fine. Um, the important thing is that when you fit a model, you need to check what its test error is um, because you don't want to accidentally come up with a model that has a great training error, but a very poor test error. OK, so, so far we've talked about linear models that we fit using least squares. But as I have alluded to, often least squares regression is not a great choice of model. And this can basically happen for two reasons. It could happen because the least squares model is not complex enough or because it's too complex. So I'm going to talk in a couple minutes about what we do if a least squares model is not complex enough for our data. But actually, typically, what we see in big biomedical data is that the least squares model is too complex in the sense that there are too many features relative to the number of observations. So for example, suppose that I want to predict a patient's response to chemotherapy. And my predictors are things like the expression levels for a whole lot of genes, maybe for you know, 20,000 genes, um, protein levels where I've assayed some huge number of proteins, or maybe just um, I've done um, DNA sequencing on genes that are potentially implicated in breast cancer. So in each of these situations, chances are we have a huge number of features or variables that we're using as predictors in our model. And if we fit a least squares model in this setting, we're actually going to get really bad test error. Our training error would look awesome, but the test error would be really bad because we'd be overfitting the data. Um, so if we fit a model that's too complex, then that's known as overfitting. Basically, a model that has a, a low training error but a high test error is a model that we've overfit to the data.
So typically, uh, least squares is going to overfit the data in the context of big biomedical data. And so what we need is an alternative to least squares. We need a way to fit a linear model, but somehow get less complexity than we'd get if we fit least squares using the p-variables. So ridge regression and the lasso are, are two methods for fitting a linear model that are alternatives to least squares. And they yield a less complex model by shrinking the regression coefficients. And so as we're going to see, these are really just minor modifications to the least squares fitting approach, but they can give us much better results um, in, case, in cases when least squares fits too complex of a model. So ridge regression and the lasso are examples of what are known as regularization approaches or penalization approaches. Um, and there are many other examples of such methods, but I'm just going to focus on ridge regression and the lasso today because those are the two best known approaches. I also just want to mention that these regularization approaches are actually a topic of extensive um, contemporary research in statistical machine learning today. Okay, so first of all, ridge regression. The idea behind ridge regression is that we're looking for coefficients beta naught through beta p that minimize a residual sum of squares. So this is just like what we had um, in the least square setting. But also there's an additional term here, which is a tuning parameter lambda times the sum over the features of beta j squared. So again, this is just like the um, least squares optimization problem, except that now there is an additional term. And so here, lambda is a non-negative tuning parameter. And we can see right away that if lambda is 0, then this term just disappears, and we're just fitting a least squares model. But as we increase lambda, this term is going to tend to decrease. The sum of beta j hat squares is going to decrease. And basically, the way that you can think about it is that there are two terms. This first term quantifies how well I'm fitting the training data. And this term quantifies how complex my model is. You can actually think of sum of beta j squared as a, as a way to quantify your model complexity. So when lambda is really small or when lambda is 0, I'm just focusing on getting a really good fit to the training data with this loss term. But when lambda is bigger, I'm going to be focusing more on getting a really simple model or a model that's not too complex with this penalty term. And actually, in the limit, when lambda becomes arbitrarily large, you can see that these beta j's are going to actually approach zero because, you know, if, if lambda is just super huge, then you're going to want your sum of beta j squareds to be really tiny so that this penalty term doesn't get too big. So you can see that, um, that lambda really controls the complexity of your model. When lambda is really big, you're going to get a really, really, really simple model with just tiny coefficient estimates. So this plot gives you a graphical representation of what ridge regression gives you as you vary the tuning parameter lambda. So here I'm showing lambda on the x-axis. The y-axis shows coefficients. And this is a, a little um, example data set with a bunch of features, um, most of which are small, and those are shown in gray. And then four features that are larger are shown in various colors. So in order to understand this figure, like take a look over here, oops, all the way on the left side um, where my cursor is. So lambda is around 0.01 here. And when lambda is 0.01, like the black coefficient is around negative 280. The red one's around 420. Um, but as I increase lambda, for example, as I make lambda equal to 1 right here, the black coefficient is slightly smaller. The red coefficient is slightly smaller. OK, these coefficients are slightly smaller. And as I make lambda really big, take a look over here, like when lambda is 100, now all the coefficients are quite a bit smaller. And over here, where lambda is 10,000, um, all the coefficients are really close to zero. So when we perform ridge regression, our results are actually a function of this tuning parameter lambda. And if you want to know what would happen with a given value of lambda, you just go to that position on the x-axis and you, you 
look at the value of the coefficients for that particular lambda. So over here we're fitting a really simple model with very low variance because all the coefficients are zero. That's very low variance, but it's going to have big bias. So overall the test error is going to be really big. Over here probably the test error is going to be big also because this model has low bias but high variance over here. And over here things are more intermediate. So probably the best value of the test error is going to be around here. But in order to find out, we'd have to use one of the approaches that I mentioned earlier for estimating the test error. So one thing that I want you to notice is that over here, when lambda is really big, all those coefficients become very close to zero. But they're actually not exactly zero. Maybe they're like 10 to the negative 3 or something. We can't quite see in this figure. But, but none of the coefficients are exactly zero. They're just becoming closer and closer to zero. So in practice, when you're performing ridge regression, you're going to choose the tuning parameter in order to minimize the test error. Um, and then value, the value of lambda that we want is the one with the smallest test error. And then we would um, run ridge regression on the full data using that same value of lambda. So what I mean by this is like, suppose you're choosing, the val you're choosing lambda using the validation set approach. So you fit. Um, fit the model on half of the observations for a bunch of values of lambda, evaluate each of those models on the other half of the observations, identify the value of lambda that gave you the smallest error rate, and now using that value of lambda, you need to rerun ridge regression on all of the observations. So the important thing to know about ridge regression is that while it can give us a, a model that's not very complex when lambda is large, that final model is going to contain all of the variables no matter what. Um, and sometimes this isn't desirable. So like imagine that you're trying to come up with a way to use um, gene expression values to predict a patient's survival time. You might want to develop that model using all 20,000 genes, but at the end of the day, you might want your final model to only involve a handful of genes because um, a final model involving just a handful of genes would be easier to like translate into clinical practice, for example. It would be less expensive to come up with a, a diagnostic involving just 20 genes rather than a diagnostic involving 20,000 genes. So if we want to fit a model that involves just a subset of the features, then ridge regression isn't going to take us there. So instead we can do what's called the lasso. And the lasso is just a small tweak to ridge regression that gives us a model with mostly zero elements. So in other words, the resulting model is sparse. And another way to, to um, phrase this is we can say that the lasso performs feature selection. So this is the optimization problem for the lasso. We're going to look for coefficients that minimize, once again, this residual sum of squares term that by now you've seen a lot of times plus a penalty. Um, this looks just like the ridge regression penalty with just one difference. Um, in ridge regression, we had a beta j squared term here. Now I've got an absolute value of beta j. And this is a really small difference, and it seems like it shouldn't matter. But actually, um, the difference is small but important because whereas ridge regression never gives you any coefficient estimates exactly equal to zero, the lasso will. So like ridge regression, we've got this tuning parameter lambda that controls model complexity. When lambda equals zero, we're just back at least squares. But most importantly, for an intermediate value of lambda, we can actually get some coefficient estimates that are exactly equal to zero. And that's the whole reason to ever do the lasso, is if you want coefficient estimates that are exactly zero, in other words, if you want a sparse model. So when lambda is very large, some of the beta j hats will be exactly zero. In contrast to ridge regression, where the best you'll ever see is that some of the beta j hats might be close to zero. So we saw a figure like this for ridge regression, and now here's the same figure for the lasso. And what I want you to notice here is like, for example, check out what happens when lambda is 500. So lambda equals 500, the black coefficient is non-zero, the yellow, red, and blue ones are non-zero, but all of these gray coefficients have estimates that are exactly zero. So right here with lambda equals 500, 
my lasso model only involves four features. So this is really nice because it means that if I, again, if I'm trying to develop a predictor of response to chemotherapy, my, my predictive model here only involves four of my 20,000 features. And that's pretty great in a lot of settings. Um, if, if instead I had lambda equals 5,000, now I have a fitted model that only involves the blue feature. All the other features are exactly zero. So again, uh, um, as we saw with ridge regression, I've got to choose this parameter lambda. The way that I typically would choose it would be based on estimating, estimating the test error using one of those approaches that we saw a few minutes ago. And that would tell us what value of lambda to use. But for example, if, it, if, it told, if that approach told us to choose lambda over here, then our final model would involve only four features. Okay, so um, that's it for ridge regression and the lasso. I want to just briefly, um, very fast, mention another approach for fitting a linear model that you may have heard of, and this is called principal components regression. And it's really a different take on, on how we can fit a less complex model than what we get using least squares. So the idea behind principal components regression is, as usual, um, we have n observations and p features. What that means is that our observations live in a p-dimensional space. But it turns out that not all those dimensions are equally useful. So for example, some of the dimensions might be completely redundant with each other, and that would be the case if our features are highly correlated. Um, other dimensions might be uninformative, um, and that would correspond to noise features. So the question is, can we find a low dimensional representation of the variables that captures most of the action? So instead of having to deal with p dimensions, can we actually just find m dimensions that do a pretty good job of, of capturing what's happening in the data? So, so this is um, broadly referred to as a dimension reduction approach. Um, there are a lot of dimension reduction approaches out there. The two best known such approaches are principal components regression and partial least squares. And right now I'm just going to mention principal components regression, but if you've heard of partial least squares, then it's a similar type of approach. So the idea behind principal components regression is that I'm going to look for variables that I'll call z1 through zm, and these are linear combinations of my original p predictors. So in other words, I'm looking for coefficients phi mj, such that zm is just a linear combination of the x's. And then once I've identified these new dimensions, z1 through zm, I'm just going to fit a least squares model. But instead of fitting the model using my original features, I'm going to fit the model with my new features, z1 through zm. So this is really simple. I'm just telling you, do least squares, but don't use the original features. Use new features. OK, well, what are these new features supposed to be? Well, these new features should be the principal components of the data. So I'm telling you to take the first m principal components of your data, fit a least squares model using those as features, and you're done. You just did principal components regression. OK, so what are principal components? Well, you're going to see these in more detail next week um, in the webinar on unsupervised learning. But the idea behind principal components is that they're linear combinations of your variables that contain as much variability of your data as possible. So they're, they're basically just a low dimensional representation of your data that captures as much of the variability as possible. So in an example with um, two variables and observations shown in purple, this green line represents the first principal component. And you can see the first principal component is sort of the direction along which your data varies the most. So if I had to summarize these purple observations in just one dimension, then this green line would give me the best possible summary. So the idea is when you do principal components regression, you're actually getting a model that's linear in the original predictors. So it is a linear model in the original predictors, but it's not the same as the least squares model that you get if you ran least squares on the original predictors. You're actually getting a much less complex model, provided that m is less than p. Um, it's important to know that principal components regression doesn't involve feature selection in the sense that all of the original predictors are involved in your final model. 
Um, the number of principal components that you have controls model complexity. So if m equals p, you're just back at least squares. Um, if m is smaller than p, you're going to get a less complex model. And as usual, we're going to decide on the level of model complexity by minimizing the test error. OK, and then just as an aside, principal components regression is actually very, very similar to ridge regression in terms of the underlying uh, mathematics. And uh, PCR works well in a lot of settings, but sometimes it fails. And really, the reason for this is because there's no guarantee that the first M principal components will explain a lot of, or will be predictive of the response. Because the first M principal components will definitely explain a lot of the variation in the features, but they might not be predictive of the response. OK, so this whole discussion of ridge regression, the lasso, and principal components regression have focused on giving you a model that's less complex than least squares. And again, that's because um, in the case of biomedical big data, usually least squares is too complex of a model in the sense that you don't have enough observations and you have a huge number of features. Um, but if it turns out that you're actually in a setting where you want a more complex model, like maybe you've just measured a dozen features and you have 20,000 observations, then don't worry, um, least squares has got you covered. You can just fit a least squares model. Oops, I'm sorry, this is a typo. It should say we can fit a linear model using transformations of your features. So. If you want to, um, you could perform least squares using features xj, xj squared, xj cubed, e to the xj. You could even take products of your features like xj with xk and so on. And in order to fit the model, you could use least squares, or you could actually perform ridge, lasso, and so on. So it's always easy to make a model more complex by just throwing in new features or combinations or transformations of your old features. Um, and that's why I haven't really focused on how to get a more complex model, because typically that's a pretty easy task. Just remember that if you're considering a complex model, you've got to estimate your test error. OK, briefly, um, I've been talking about regression. Um, classification is when you have a categorical or a qualitative response. Um, and the reason I haven't talked about classification is because it's easy. Everything that I've talked about for regression, it applies exactly the same way to classification. Um, so once you get it with regression, you're going to understand classification too. All of the same ideas apply. OK, well, I'm really almost out of time, but I just want to spend two minutes talking about a fun topic, which is decision trees. So everything that I've mentioned so far is within the framework of a linear model, but of course, um, there's other ways you can do supervised learning, too. And a really fun one is a decision tree. So the idea behind a decision tree is that you are going to partition the range of x into boxes, and then you're going to make a prediction within each box. So decision tree models are very interpretable. Um, and to show you how interpretable it is, we can look at an example. So this is just a toy data set. And what we're going to do is predict a baseball player's salary based on various characteristics. So here's a regression tree for this baseball data set. Um, and so here's how you read it. You start at the top, and you say, all right, um, if, I've been if this player has been playing baseball for less than four and a half years, we're going to go to the left. And if they've been playing for more than four and a half years, we're going to go to the right. So whenever there's a branch, um, or whenever there's a split, rather, if the answer is yes, you're going to go to the left. And if it's no, you'll go to the right. So let's say that there's a player who's been playing for less than four and a half years. OK, we're going to go down to the left. And this, if this player batted in fewer than 60 runs last season, we're going to go to the left again. If they had more than 82 putouts, we're going to go to the right. All right, now we've got to check, have they been playing for, for more than or fewer than three and a half years? And if they've been playing for more than three and a half years, then my prediction of their salary is 5.183. So this is actually on the log scale, and it's in thousands of dollars. So to figure out how many dollars this is, um, multiply, or rather take it, calculate e to the 5.183, and then multiply by 1,000. Um, and the reason that this is on the log scale is just because um, 
it's better to model salary on a log scale than on a linear scale. Um, so alternatively, if, if the player who you want to predict salary for has played for more than four and a half years and they did more than 118 or 117 and a half hits last season and fewer than 52 and a half walks, then they actually are going to have substantially higher salary, e to the 6.549 thousands of dollars per year. So regression trees are, are really great because you don't need to know any math. Um, you don't need a computer to understand them. Um, you can, like, imagine you're working in an emergency room and there might just be some regression tree. Um, and this can just be, like, you know, pasted on the wall at the nurse's station and it gives the nurses, like, a really quick way to just look, um, look up a patient's characteristics and then get the prediction that they need. So decision trees are interpretable. The whole reason to ever use a decision tree is because you want a picture like this, because you want something like this that you can show to someone who's, um, who either doesn't want to have to like, figure out all the math or um, just doesn't have time and they need something quick that they can look at. Regression trees typically are not as, interpret or are not as accurate as other approaches to supervised learning, but they are interpretable. So if you care about interpretability, then great. And if you don't care about interpretability, this is not a good choice because you can do better in terms of accuracy using other methods. Um, so I just want to show in a little more detail um, how do we get this tree. Well, suppose that our only variables were the number of hits last season and the number of years that the player has been playing. So what we do is we partition feature space in a very particular way in order to get these three regions, R1, R3, and R2. And then to get the prediction within the region R1, we just take the average of the observations in this region. To get the prediction within R3, we average those observations. And to get the prediction within this region, we average those observations. And that gives us a tree that looks like this, where the number reported here is the average within the regions R1, R2, and R3. Okay, so when you're, when you're building a decision tree, you can decide how big you want your tree to be. A large tree is going to tend to overfit the data. A small tree is going to underfit the data. And we typically want to use the test error in order to determine what's the best tree size. So for example, on the baseball data, on the left we have a really big tree. On the right we have a much smaller tree. Um, the one on the left is going to have low bias but high variance. The one on the right is going to have low variance but possibly high bias. And the way that we would choose which tree we want is, is by estimating the test error. Okay, so I just want to close with a couple of, maybe one final comment, um, which I don't have time to go into detail. But this comment is basically that um, it doesn't matter how fancy the machine learning is that you're doing, you always have to think about just the underlying science and the experimental design. And in particular, one really big problem that we see within the context of um, big biomedical data is issues called batch effects. Um, and batch effects can occur if there's some kind of variability in your data that results from non-biological factors. Um, batch effects are a huge problem in, in biological data. And there's only so much that you can do in order to deal with them. In order to avoid um, having batch effects and validate your results, it's really important to um, have good experimental design. So you should randomize your sample run times. Um, for example, you don't want to run the cases first and then the controls. Um, you should try to avoid having batch effects in the first place by reducing the extraneous sources of variation in your experiment. Um, typically, it's better if when you fit a model, you fit the model on multiple data sets collected in different labs or different institutions rather than on a single data set. And really, most importantly, it's really important that you validate any results that you get on independent data sets collected in a different lab or in a different institution, because otherwise the presence of batch effects in your data could make your results look really good. Even your test error could look really good. But if you had evaluated test error on an independent data set, it might not look so good. OK, and then finally, the last thing I want to say is um, if you're doing supervised machine learning, there's no best approach. There's a lot of ways you can do it. I've talked about a number of methods for supervised machine learning, but 
there's literally textbooks that are just filled with supervised machine learning approaches. But what I want to emphasize is that there's no best way. Sometimes one approach is going to work better than another. Um, and, and so we can't say that one approach is best, but we can say that some approaches are wrong. So for example, you could calculate, um, you could do cross-validation wrong, and then your test error estimate would be wrong, and you'd be choosing a really bad model. So no approach is best, but some approaches are wrong. And if you get one thing from this lecture, the thing that you get is, should be that test error is really important, and that you've got to make sure that you're calculating it right, because a model that has a high test error is just really meaningless and not useful in, in actually in any context. Okay, great. Um, it looks like I'm out of time. Um, that's it, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Daniela. That was really a, a great overview of uh, statistical learning. Uh, supervised in contrast to what we'll hear about next week. I think one of the themes that uh, ran through your presentation was really how with our modeling techniques we struggle with that curse of dimensionality and we've had a series of questions about um, basically relating to this. Is, is there an assumption with all the, the dimensionality that we have and the complexity of these models that the underlying distributional properties are normally distributed in Gaussian or how, I mean, how much can we deviate from that and still be able get, to get good estimates? Yeah, okay, so um, Gaussianity is typically like not a huge issue in my opinion. Um, so like if you took your intro stats class and you learned about linear models, you probably were told that you should assume that the errors are normal, normally distributed. Um, and it turns out like that's just not a huge assumption. It's just not a big deal. If your errors aren't normal, you're probably fine, as long as you have a big sample size. But where you really run into trouble is when your sample size is small relative to the number of features you have or relative to the amount of complexity of the model you're trying to fit. And if, if your model is just too complex for the available data, it doesn't matter what distribution your data has, you're just in trouble. So the bottom line is that model complexity is incredibly important. Um, in that question, you, you use the phrase cursive dimensionality. And cursive dimensionality is just a very evocative phrase to describe this, this phenomenon that I've, I've mentioned, which is that a more complex model, it can be a curse. Like, if you measure more variables, don't just assume that more data is better data, because more data just makes you tempted to have a more complex model, and that can just lead to a high test error. So the bottom line remains, um, you just got to think about test error. More complex is not better. Uh, low test error is better. Right, so I think a lot, when a lot of people are building their models, particularly using like a linear regression based type of a thing, and they look at uh, some sort of a, a overall uh, measure of fit or overall uh, amount of variance accounted for, for example, uh, they typically want to look at the overall statistical significance of that model, like using a, a, an F statistic or something, and the degrees of freedom sort of capture that model complexity about those variables which are in the model versus those which are part of the error term. How does that act as a governor on those tests? And if that's not still acceptable, are there alternatives like information-based metrics that one could use as a measure of overall fit that um, uh, may be more appropriate? Right. Okay, that's a great question. So there were a couple parts to that. So first of all, um, okay, if you want to know how complex your model is, I'm, however you phrase the question, I'm always going to give you the same answer, which is the test error is the best way to figure out how well your model fits the data and how complex it is. Because you can, you know, there's all kinds of papers about different methods, information theoretic methods and so on, but at the end of the day, like if I'm fitting a predictive model, what I want is a model that fits a test observation well. Done. There's, no, there's literally nothing else that I care about. So test error is simple, it's intuitive, and it gets at what you want. I don't know, really, I can't think of any example in the supervised learning context where you'd care about anything else other than test error. Now, another question that was part of that was, um, how can we actually quantify model complexity? Mm -hmm. You mentioned degrees of freedom. And as you know, if you fit a linear model using least squares, you can actually just quantify linear complexity. Excuse me, you can quantify model complexity 
by just counting the number of variables in your model. So you fit a least squares model with 10 variables, you used up 10 degrees of freedom, done. Unfortunately, as soon as you move away from least squares to ridge regression, the lasso, principal components regression, decision trees, you can no longer just count up the number of variables that you're using. Mm -hmm. So a really good way to see that is in the context of ridge regression. Like ridge regression, no matter what value of the tuning parameter you have, um, you're always going to be using all p variables. So clearly, just counting the number of variables in your model is not a good way to quantify model complexity. So model complexity, if you wanted to say, like, what's the complexity of model A versus model B, where one is like a decision tree and one is a lasso model, that's actually really a challenging thing to quantify. And I wouldn't typically recommend just trying to go head to head between two models and figuring out which is more or less complex. Instead, I would again go back to test error and I would just choose the model with the lowest test error. Because test error is a universal quantity that you can compare across models of very different types. Great. Well, we've run out of time, unfortunately. Um, I'd like to encourage everybody who does have questions for, for Dr. Witten. I'm sure that uh, uh, you can find her, her email address. It was on the uh, kind of front of her slide set there. Um, and if you were to write to her with any questions, I'm sure she'd be delighted to answer them. Um, once again, thank you, uh, Dr. Witten, for giving a great lecture on supervised uh, uh, statistical learning. Um, very appropriate to big data in a lot of context for our, our listeners. And uh, once again, thank you, and thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll uh, see you again next week. Thank you.